anyway, thank you, uh, Kristen, for that um, introduction. It's always a little bit embarrassing to be introduced. Um, I'm here largely as an advocate, and I'm here talking to you um, because my commitment is improving healthcare. I was a nurse uh, for 10 years that started in ICU. I don't recommend that, by the way, those of you who think about going into nursing. ICU is not always the best place to start. Uh, a year of ICU, several years of ER nursing. I was out on the uh, floor. I've worked in behavioral health. And I was one of those people on whom technology was foisted, that I had no, uh, played no role in selecting the technologies that were used, uh, complained, was frustrated about it, right? One of those people that gets on all of yours nerves, right, when you're trying to uh, implement technology. And so, uh, but I also became very interested in change. So I went back to graduate school. My degree is actually in organization behavior, but it was from MIT uh, during the tech boom. So it just so happened every company who came to the MIT management department looking for help with anything and uh, offering themselves as a research site, they were doing something with technology. So I ended up spending about 15 years outside healthcare uh, doing research in the automotive industry, uh, on a deep water oil platform, high tech, I've been in Cisco and Sun as they were uh, playing with new technologies. And so my research uh, background was all around how people use technology and why, how the same technology, uh, it crafted exactly the same, is used very differently, not only in different organizations, but in different departments in the same organization, and sometimes by different by people who sit on two opposite sides of a partition uh, of a cubicle, right? And so understanding why that happens, how that happens, um, and watching leaders while they're trying to introduce new technologies and being frustrated, right? The, the old refrain is, oh, those people just don't like to change. But I had been one of those people, right, and appreciated that sometimes the way the technology gets introduced and, and often the quality of the technology itself is at stake. So uh, this presentation, my collaborator is Shannon Halgren. Uh, she's a human factors uh, scientist. Her degree's from Rice, but she's now based in Boulder, Colorado. About six years ago, she and I were introduced by a mutual acquaintance. She was doing a project in the OR. And again, I'd been out of healthcare for a while at this point. And but she needed somebody with clinical experience to go into the OR, deck out in scrubs, and really understand these people's workflow for a new, a new product that was being developed. And it's got ethnographic research for those of you who uh, do that. So I was doing that and I realized, one, I'm home. <laughs> uh, healthcare is really all I cared about. And so since then I've been focusing only on the healthcare industry. Uh, but also Shannon and I discovered that we were good collaborators and we've done a series of projects uh, together since. And what you're going to see today is the culmination of that six years or so of work on a variety of uh, devices and uh, both um, IT kind of interfaces as well as physical devices that often have uh, an electronic interface component. And I, this started, I guess, in about 2013 that we put our heads together and said, you know, something's different about healthcare. Uh, because she, still, she does projects for, you know, Apple, Netflix, et cetera, et cetera. But she also does devices. So her, her practice is split about half and half between healthcare and other industries. And she had designed a product uh, for a client and used all the rules, all the design rules, made it cool, et cetera, et cetera, right? That in the design community, that would have been like, oh, man, that's great. That's really good. And she went to her healthcare client, and they're like, uh-uh. No, you got to get rid of all the cool stuff and make it ugly, you know, for, in her perspective, ugly. So, so we started talking about what is it, right, that's different about healthcare. And anyway, so th this, this project came out of that. That's just sort of your, your background. And so when vendors come to you who don't have uh, healthcare experience, um, they don't have enough clinical representation on their design team, that kind of stuff, they run into some of these problems. And my goal, uh, our goal in creating this presentation and this particular uh, version of it for this audience is to help you be uh, savvier, harder, tougher, um, consumers, right, customers, when it comes to the procurement process, if you're out there in the facility, if you're representing a vendor, our goal is that you can come from this and have, you know, uh, there are lots and lots of criteria for design, and I'll go into that in more detail. So you'll come out of this with like a short list that you can write on the back of an envelope that you can use with, if, if you're a startup and you're working on a product, you can say, does it meet these criteria, okay? And so the ultimate goal is that together we're all making healthcare work better. So I need a clicker. Let's get going. Um, we're going to start with some common approaches to tech procurement uh, used in hospitals today and talk about why those sometimes don't get you the results that you expect. 
um, then why usability matters and why usability should be part of the procurement conversation. Then we're going to take a peek into the life of an ICU uh, nurse. Just, you know, one of the things that we do find is that uh, vendors often have a chief medical officer. They have a couple docs on the board, but they don't really have a sense of what it's like to be at the bedside for nurses, respiratory therapists, your lab technicians, the full range of people who end up using a technology. And so we're going to take a peek, and, and just for HIPAA and all sorts of other reasons, right? We're often not in the room as an IT specialist. We're out in the hall. Uh, so this will give you a chance to take a peek inside the room. Then we're going to understand what the, the connection is uh, between that, we'll go backwards, uh, between what we see in the room and this concept called cognitive load from psychology, which we'll unpack when we get there. And then finally, actually the bulk of the presentation, then we'll be talking about these design principles. So let's talk about some common tech procurement processes, right? So over on the left, we need a new EHR. And where the EHR is there, that can be a blank, right? It can be a new analytics program, as Kristen was saying at the beginning. Uh, it can be a new portal, new clinical decision support, whatever it is that you're shopping for. Oops, there we go. Several possible approaches. Initially, you assign it to IT, right? Uh, so let's say five, 10 years ago in healthcare, be like, that's technology. We don't know anything about technology. Get IT, tell IT to choose the thing, implement it for us, tell us what to do, right? The clinical people just didn't want to have a, lot, a big part of it until often it was too late in the game. Other industries learned the same lesson, right? As an industry, I think that we've become more sophisticated. And so we now know um, demos, right? So we need more stakeholders in. And is John Mason here? I'm not seeing John. He told me that this was a process that they had used uh, when he was at St. David's. So they get all the stakeholders, the chief nursing officer, uh, chief financial officer. So you've got some chief people. You've got some director and, and mid-level management people. They all are in a big room. They've got a list of criteria. And, um, and then these dem you know, vendors, like three or four in a day, come in and present. And then they, they rate the criteria. And then they have the next vendor, right? Great. So that's more sophisticated. You've got more stakeholders, but you still don't have the users, and you're still sitting in a conference room like this, right? And you're watching a, a pro uh, do the presentations. Next step, road trip, right? So this is one that I've seen a bunch of doctors and, and uh, managers may go out to a number of facilities, and they'll see the technology in use in sight. And they'll say, how's it going for you? What do you like? You know, what, what problems have you had? So it gets them closer to the point of use, um, but we'll talk about some limitations of that. And then finally, tech fair is another approach. So this is often, um, they get permission from one or two vendors to set up a table in the cafeteria. And as employees are going to and from lunch, they have them stop and say, hey, you know, try this out. Tell me which one you like. And they have a little survey there. So that's common approaches. Oops, do I, have to, I think I have a point here maybe. There we go. Features uh, that you're going, criteria features, cost, Compatibility, that's usually the big concern of the IT community. And then there might be this notion of usability, which is usually more along the lines of, what'd you like? Did you like this one or that one? Right? It's, it's not very formalized. So you go to all this trouble, and still somehow you end up with angry doctors. Right? Angry doctors, angry nurses, frustrated people, you have an attrition, the morale's down, you know, um, uh, absentee rates are up. And we say, doctors and nurses hate to change. You know those people. They just, they just hate to change. They'll get over it. The technology's great. But maybe there's another reason, right? And I'm going to, my argument is that it's poor usability. What does that mean? Some of the common things, difficult to read. Small font, gray font on a white background, uh, strange fonts, inconsistent fonts. Related fields are not grouped together. So one of the big EHRs, I, I participated as a trainer uh, for them. They will let them remain nameless. But they have a tab at the top that says medications. There's a tab on the left side that says medications. And the main form where the medical assistant or nurse is uh, entering information, like when you go into the doctor's office, there's a section that says medications. For the love of God, don't do that, right? Um, it, it's out there. It's in use. But that's the kind of thing that ca causes people's eyes to cross. Uh, numbers are shown without labels or units of measure. So you'll have the field for a weight, but you won't know if it's kilograms or pounds. Uh, there will be a number slash and another number, and you're supposed to know that that's weight and body uh, mass index. Great that everybody maybe knows that initially in training, but it still requires the user to be computing that and thinking that all the time, right? They're having to keep up with 
all that information. Inconsistent use of color. Yellow can highlight something important on one uh, screen. Then you change screens and it's a sign of danger. And then you change screens and it's a sign of something new. There, we'll get more of these up here. Maybe. There we go. Um, I'll just go ahead. Uh, inconsistent placement of operators, right? So the, the go button, the send, the accept, the OK. You may have, it may be on the right. It might be on the left. It might be at the bottom of the screen. So the user's hunting around. And lists with no discernible order. This is one of the, the uh, biggest offenders in a lot of applications. And the doctors complain about it because they just have to scroll. List, 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 right? If it were alphabetical, they could go quickly. <clears throat> if it had some sort of intelligent search, they could use that. Uh, and a single task requiring several screen changes. How many of you have physicians who say, that's seven clicks? They count the clicks. Yeah, they know. They know exactly how many clicks right, every task takes. The list goes on and on and on. So how does it happen, right? And this, I've already touched on some of these, previewed them. Features, especially when as an industry we were uh, young in the field, then you have a list of features and you have two products and two lists of features, the one with the most features must be the better product, right? Or you, ha or you have this critical list of features. It's like, well, okay, this has everything we need and it costs less, so we'll get this one, right? Features are not usability. Watching a sales demo is not the same as actual use. So when I was at the UT Health IT program, um, every Friday was lab day. And in the morning, there was a, a vendor rep, right, who came from Greenway or EMDs or um, eClinical Words, et cetera. We'd spend the morning watching, watching him present, and we'd turn to each other and be like, oh, my God, that's great. Oh, this is a lot better than the one last week. Look, you know, we'd be all excited. We spent the afternoon in the lab entering patient information ourselves. And we were given two, uh, how many students do we have here? Do we have students from UT today? Okay, okay, our rep, our rep, good. So you get these two profiles, right? A simple patient and a complex patient, and your job, your lab assignment, is to get that information into the uh, EHR and to look up a few things while you're there. We spent the afternoon, it would take us like four hours, right, to do two patients or something. And it's, it's like, wait a minute, where's that thing? How did they click? I remember the screen looked like. So, so this whole notion of having a, a pro rep who does nothing but demos day after day after day as part of their sales, that's not the same thing as having your own people use, use the technology. Asking others about their experience is also not the same as actual use in your facility. Products get customized. Right, so the, the instance of the product that you're seeing in use when you go on your road trip may not be the one that you uh, end up using yourself. And because of the way healthcare has developed and because technology has not been widespread, there's still a lot of very local definitions and uh, processes, that kind of thing. And so uh, just because the interface makes sense to their staff doesn't mean it's gonna make sense to your staff. Uh, and then finally, options are still limited. So if you are a Seton, an HCA, um, I guess, you know, Kaiser built their own. Are they implementing, does it, if Kaiser, are they still on their own or do they go with Epic or something? They did finally go with Epic, okay. There are only so many vendors who have a product that is robust enough, right, and has all the modules that are, that are needed. So we have a limited capacity. So that's the other, my other motive here is to start assembling the small army of people who will start asking you know, hard questions and pushing the envelope and raising the bar. We have to use the technology that's available to us now, but as a community, I think that we can continue to be a force for um, making it better. So for those of you, uh, who in here is new to usability? Anybody? Pretty familiar topic? Okay, great. So just quickly, a couple definitions. Um, the one at the top is the International Standard Organization. The second one is um, one that's often referenced in any kind of academic study in the healthcare realm, uh, just because uh, Zhang and Walzhi, I'm not sure how you say his name, uh, actually just restated the International Standards Organization. But the three key components are uh, basically efficiency, effectiveness, satisfaction, and in the uh, domain of use. Context of use, there we go. I think maybe, there we go. Um, so two things, one, that usability is often overlooked for a variety of reasons, cost often overrides, or some people that I speak to about this, they say, Julia, there's just so many stakeholders, it's so hard to get everybody on the same page, I can't also 
care about usability, right? We just have to go forward with the thing we can afford that's compatible with our existing systems. Everybody just has to live with it. We'll talk about why that's not necessarily a great strategy. But for now, to again, to help you appreciate the importance of usability and what it really means in context, we're going to focus on the uh, context of use. And we're going to do that by, there we go, visiting our friend Rook. Oh, let me get out of your way. Just pay attention to the number of different interfaces. She interacts with analog, digital. <clears throat> Passive and active. The sheer amount of equipment. She's teaching someone at the same time she's performing her work. This is routine in healthcare. That's how all nurses get trained. Okay. She hadn't even gotten her own primary patient, right, for the day. So, so she's doing this over and over again. Every patient has a different uh, constellation of these devices. Yes, you see some of the same devices over and over, right? But she's constantly moving between um, physical, electronic, uh, passive things that she's reading, active things that she has to interact with, uh, gauges, right, on syringes. She, you see her like she's lifting. Uh, looking under a piece of plastic, right, to work on uh, one piece of stuff. So just to appreciate the complexity of the context. Given that, it's probably not surprising that safety is a concern, right? And we all know that safety is a concern. Everybody here uh, right, you know, knows the uh, stats in the industry, roughly 100,000 people a day. Then they realize, oh, we probably uh, underestimated that grossly. The most uh, 100,000 people a year, I'm sorry, not a day. Uh, most recently, the, the most recent number I saw was 500 and something thousand uh, people dying a year. Another two to eight million are uh, significantly injured by medical errors throughout the year. So usability matters for safety. And here, this is an example uh, from the ONC. A patient started with a low potassium level. Anybody know potassium? What it's important for? Heart. The heart, yeah. A variety of other things, but the heart's really important in this particular case. His potassium is not uh, horrible, right? But it's, it's low enough that it requires treatment. So Dr. A uh, orders this 40 milli equivalent to be administered over four hours. At 40, it's a little uh, piggyback. And those of you who've seen IV antibiotics, right, you know, there are these big bags with lots of fluid and then these little bags that they add. So he was going to give this little bolus of uh, potassium. Then he realized, oh, the guy already has an IV. And it actually hurts. Potassium can hurt a little bit when you go in. So that little bag, I'll just add that same amount to the bigger bag. It'll go in slower over time and it won't hurt the patient. So he puts in a second order. And he attempts to cancel the first order, but he doesn't cancel the first order. He canceled something that looks similar, right, or clicked on that that looks similar. So we have little intense dose, bigger dose over longer time, both of them still ordered. Pharmacy fills one. The second one with the big bag, they say, oh, you can't put 100 in there. You have to put 80. This exceeds our threshold. Okay, so that's fixed. But the guy's still going to get two doses. The medicines come to the nurse. The nurse hangs both bags, the piggyback intense dose and the big bag. 
Then we have shift change. Dr. B comes in. He sees this initial, let's see if we can get our pointer to work, this initial 3.1. He thinks it's the recheck of the potassium after treatment. So he treats it again, right? Goes through a, a similar regimen again. And 36 hours later, when they check the guy's potassium at 7.8, then they track back and figure out what the error was. Right? But there was nothing in the system that, that made the error obvious to them. And when you have two physicians, right, the nurses and the pharmacy staff, we can say, oh, they just need to pay closer attention. Right? They're not being responsible, they're not being vigilant. But when you get this kind of widespread problem, there's a, there's a model, the Swiss cheese problem of errors, right? Of, that there's something wrong kind of at each stage. Then we have to start asking, is it a system issue? Oops, right, and so here's a lot of places where something, the system could have been helpful. There we go. Usability also matters for cost, and we worry a lot about cost at the front end when we see the price tag for an EHR. Those of you in the uh, technical world know that there can be a lot of hidden costs in terms of the number of interfaces that need to be uh, developed later on if you have interoperability issues and uh, maintenance issues, updates, etc. So there can be costs there. But another uh, hidden cost is often the usability. And so let's say EHR 1 and 2, we'll just be very generic here. You've got some task. It's a very common task, has to be repeated a lot. And in one system it takes 30 seconds, and another system it takes 15 seconds. Negligible, right? And 15 seconds. We go through the uh, whole process here, right? If it's a task, each nurse repeats it 10 times. I just use some numbers here that make the math easy. Let's say you have 100 nurses per shift, three shifts a day, et cetera, et cetera. This is how much money it costs to perform that task on an annual basis. The same task, half the time, right? You've got substantial savings. Oops, maybe. And that's just for one task, right? So I, when I talk to chief nursing officers about this, they say, yeah, Julia, I know that that's true. But whose budget does that come out of? It comes out of all y'all's budget for the life of the product. This is one task for one year, right? So if you have your EHR in place for three years, for five years, uh, how often are you updating? How often do you update your EHR? Let's say big hospital system. Do we have any big hospital system represented? Well, you do little options, small options, and travel, but then you do big, great big options. Okay. Okay, roughly. So then let's say you go through again and you don't fix this. You might not fix that You might not, right, ever, right? Uh, I know uh, St. Dave HCA, right, they've been on Meditech for forever, right? And there are probably a lot of really basic things that haven't changed. And finally, <laughs> there was laughter. Uh, finally, usability matters for quality. And um, you don't have to raise your hands because then you'd have to, like, turn somebody in. But we all know that because of ambiguous labeling, too many fields, any kind of confusion, docs in particular, but docs and nurses, both anybody who uses the system, is burying all sorts of information in free text fields, right? If they can't find the right field easily, if it's not operating well, if it requires extra clicks to put the units in after they put the thing, they'll just bury it in free text. you think I'd figure this out, would you? Um, then you end up with skewed data, right? Because the data that is used um, for your quality reporting, that gets pulled from the discrete fields. Erroneous scoring reporting, lost reimbursement, yada yada. Right? So if you've got poor usability and staff are also being told they can't have overtime, right? And they have to make some choices, there will be there will be workarounds, they will cut corners. Their license is at risk if they cut corners on the clinical side, although some corners get cut there as well. Um, but they're doing their best to take care of patients and get out on time, they're going to do whatever they can, right? Whatever's fast, whatever works. So let's go back to Rook. These are some stills from that and talk about the context and why this is important in terms of translating uh, what we can understand about the context into principles of usability. I mentioned several of these things as we went through. Frequent interruptions, right? A lot of task switching. She's 
uh, talking to a coworker. She's taking care of the patient. She's teaching someone. She's interacting with the interface. She's interacting with a different interface. That's happening all the time. Probably has a mobile device that's going off or a vocera uh, device, communication device, where she's getting uh, messages, right, that other patients need her or a physician has called, that kind of thing. Uh, lots of equipment. High sensory stimulation, uh, and we'll talk about why this is sensory stimulation. We'll talk about why this is important. Uh, we tend to think in a lot of usability studies that are just done in a lab where the focus is on the device. Um, it's just how usable this particular uh, device is. We often don't appreciate that it's being used in an environment that is loud, where the lighting's poor, where someone's having to reach overhead. Right? So there's a lot of other factors. I hope that's not my own phone. I probably <laughs> I've done that before. Um, that's right. The uh, physical complexity and then training during tasks. We talked about those things. So, whoops, go back. All that stuff, right, which if we're just kind of looking at it, we might say it's just a really messy environment. And, but psychologists, what they see when they look at that is cognitive load. And uh, the technical analog for y'all is RAM, right? So, if you have too many applications open, you know, if your machine starts to drag, like, i got to start closing some things, right? I'm taxing the system. It can't do that anymore. Um, if you're, even if your hard drive, right, kind of gets too full at a certain point, just it's not, it's not going to interact as well with your RAM. Um, it's stuff that's need, needing to be saved. It's going to slow you down. The same thing is true of people, right? So this notion of cognitive load is our short-term memory, the operating memory that is interacting all the time, taking in information, uh, processing it quickly, making decisions, deciding what, what does and doesn't go into long-term memory, relating it to things that it's seen before. And psychologists differentiate three different kinds of cognitive load, or you might think of it as levels as well. And the first is the intrinsic load. That's what I was talking about, where you just focus on the device itself. How easy or difficult is it to operate, right? If we were testing EHRs in, in a lab or uh, like they do at the program with the students, um, you know, use this. Is it easy or difficult? That kind of thing. So that's just it in isolation. Uh, here are some examples. Starting an IV, using, the fibrillator, using a defibrillator, robotic surgery. The second thing is the extrinsic load. And this is where the stimulation in the environment becomes very important. So... Uh, distractions, if you're having to keep mental notes of things, right? Um, some facilities have bedside computers, other facilities don't. So the nurses are either dumping that information on a piece of paper, their brain in their pocket, right? Or they're carrying it in their head until they can get to a computer. And one of the studies that we did, uh, the nurses were very excited about a technology that we were working with that would give them kind of a backdoor access to computers because they say, we're always having to fight with the residents, right? There's never a computer available when I need it. So in that environment, you know, nurses are probably carrying a lot of information. Uh, and then conversation, right? Conversing with the patient, conversing with the patient's family, conversing with the uh, doctor or with the coworker. And then finally, the germane load. So, so you've got the task, then you've got all this ambient stuff going on, you know, noise, uh, interruptions, and then you've got the part of the brain that is trying to relate the experience to previous experiences. So if I'm working with an IV pump, I'm like, is this similar or different from the ones I've used before? That's how I'm going to learn uh, about it and remember for myself how I operate this. Is the lab module the same or different as the medications module? Um, we worked with another product where to turn uh, a particular function on and off was just a toggle. You push it on, and then you push it again to turn it off. The same interface, a different button, when you pushed it on, there was a cancel button. Seems very small, but in the like 12 minutes that they were working on that task in the lab, the nurses started developing muscle memory, right, for like after they'd gone through this, and, and it messed them up every time that turning something off that looked similar but there were two different ways to turn it off. So things like that, right? They're always looking for consistency, and when they're trying to make sense of something, if, if they get an error message or something, it's like, okay, you know, I know what these things mean. So again, we'll get more to than what you can do about that from the technology side. The other thing to understand is all these things that we're talking about, all these different kinds of memory, is that it's cumulative, just like your RAM, right? So the fact that it's open, opening an application, the fact that it's processing something or looking for information, the fact that it's saving something, right? It all that adds up to the total load that's on your RAM at that time. The problem is that people have a, and let's see if we can see, there we go, relatively limited and stable capacity 
for the, just like your RAM, right? It's a 128 or it's a gig or it's whatever it is, but it's got a limit. And we do too, and we vary from person to person. And if we chunk information in the right way, and if it's something that we've studied, we can raise the limit a little bit for particular kinds of information, but there's really not that much variation there. The demand on healthcare workers' cognitive capacity, however, continues to increase, right? So just more devices, every device that gets introduced into the care environment in an attempt to make care easier or safer or whatever, if it's a new interface, uh, if it's a new device that requires interaction, resetting, uh, calibrating, right, it adds actually to the cognitive load. And the research is solid. Um, from very simple tasks to very complex tasks, the second, and I, I mean, it's like it really is within seconds, that the demand on cognitive capacity exceeds a person's, uh, the demand exceeds the person's capacity, performance drops off. And that's why we see in cell phone driving, or, or driving with, right, talking on the cell phone, people walking, right, that we used to joke about, you can't walk and chew gum at the same time. Um, They've done it with simple tasks that they do in the psych lab, you know, studies where they're, uh, they're writing something. They have them write the same thing over and over. And then they add some other task or tapping with their finger, right, from that level on. Performance will decline when you uh, pass this threshold. Poor usability taxes the capacity, right? It adds to the load of what the person is having to deal with. So distractions. For instance, alerts. If I'm entering vital signs or if I'm entering medications or if I'm entering allergies, but alerts fire about something other than what I'm working on right then, it's not helpful to me, right? It's, it's a distraction. I'm like, okay, well, oh yeah, I'm working on medicines, but oh, there's something going on here with the, you know, with the vital signs. Um, if you're in ICU and it's life-threatening, you want it to happen whenever, you know, whenever it happens, but you really want to keep that to a minimum, have it be emergency situations. Uh, if the information sequence is out of order for what the practitioner, uh, how the practitioner operates. And the challenge with this is that no two practitioners operate exactly the same. But there are some in nursing education, in physician education, I haven't gone through respiratory education, but I'm sure it's the same thing there. There are some, some basic frameworks that are used to organize how they assess the patient, how they decide what intervention is needed, right? Um, whether it's a head to toe, whether it's subjective, objective assessment and plan, the SOAP uh, framework that physicians were trained on for uh, eons, right? So whatever that framework is, if the technology doesn't reflect that and mirror that back, the person is, you know, who's been trained is operating in one way and then they're having to disassemble the information that they've, that they've taken in and re-enter it in a different way. Uh, memory load, we've mentioned like the nurse carrying stuff in her head while he or she goes and finds a computer terminal. Um, even screen switching, this is one of the reasons that screen switching is so frustrating. You have a lab, you want to look up another lab. If a window can pop up and so the information you were working with to begin with was there and the other relevant information you can come up and they can stay side by side, great, right? They often don't count those clicks in the same way as they count if every time they click it changes a page and you're having to hold the information in their head while you get to the next page and remember what you're looking for, right? I know how many times I've heard people, oh, I forget what I was looking for, right? So they go back to their note, wherever they were, it's like, oh yeah, I was looking for the potassium. Um, and then any kind of extra processing, and we'll look at some screens for this, right? So any kind of inconsistency that requires them to continually think about how the interface works. The good news, right, is that I mean, health IT can be a drain and, and a challenge in all aspects of cognitive load, but it can also uh, be an aid. And hopefully you'll walk away from here with some sense of how to make it better. So the six principles that Kristen mentioned at the beginning that can help reduce cognitive load uh, are on the screen. And they correspond, but the reason, part of why we went through the, the cognitive load framework is just so you can appreciate how they plug in and there's an evidence base um, for how we came up with these principles. Uh, those of you, I don't see Greg Lydell, Hayden, those are some uh, other usability practitioners in town. And if they were going to evaluate your product, they'd have a list of like 14 criteria. There's a standard list that we uh, evaluate devices by. Um, but many of them can fall under these and we think most of, most of us can't remember 14, but we can remember six. 
So simple, helpful, smart, calm, uh, consistency, and being a team player. And we'll talk about what each of these means. Uh, I'll pause here. Any questions or concerns? I forget. This is such a like a an august environment, right? It kind of sets up the, the uh, fact that you're not supposed to interrupt. In the other room, we're used to interrupting. But uh, do feel free to throw up your hand if um, I don't make sense or you have a question. So we'll start with the uh, intrinsic load, just the device itself. All right, the subject matter should be complex, but the user experience shouldn't be. What does simple mean? Right, so you're looking at a device, you're looking at two different devices. One may, be, may seem inappropriately simple, right, to you. And so you know, how do you decide what's simple? Minimal, it needs to have everything that you're looking for, but nothing extra. Right, so this is another way that uh, designing for healthcare, for designers anyway, for tech designers, is often different for them than if they've designed for something in the entertainment industry or for uh, something for engineers to be used by other engineers, um, where you know more is better, and the more features, and that's what differentiates you, is more, more, more. You want everything you need to perform the function and to be safe, but you want to get rid of anything extraneous or control the rate at which it's revealed to people. And we'll look at a good example of this. Um, good visual design, and then being direct. Very careful use of abbreviations, icons, um, making those redundant. If you have an icon and there's also room for text on there, uh, doing both of those. Right? So to make sure that you're not missing, missing someone. Oops. There we go. So here's an example, the test of the minimal. I'd say you're on your way, uh, you know, you're running to work, you need to decide, do you need an umbrella or not today? Or do you need a coat or not? Do the kids need a coat before they go to school? The bus is outside. Which of these interfaces do you want to look at? Right? The interface on the left has a role. Right? Perhaps if, if you are going on a hiking trip, if you're planning a lengthy vacation, if you're going to be moving between microclimates, right, or something, you need to make sure you have all the gear packed uh, for a one-week trip, great. Uh, but if you're running out the door, and often a lot of healthcare tasks are performed in the context that would need the uh, interface on the right. Then being direct. So on this interface, all these things could be the same color, right? But we all know red, yellow, green, right? That's used in so many things. So instead of having all of them flash or beep all the time, you can just make the uh, state very obvious right, by using the appropriate color, and the nurse can then immediately know to look at the yellow and reds. And the green, if it's green, it's okay. Helpful is about thinking about guided workflows, right, rather than features. Let's talk about what this means. A couple of questions, and these slides will be available. I'd rather get to the example. Uh, one, this quote, when you're stressed out, making it dummy proof is better. Right, this came from uh, one of our studies, and we see that repeated a lot. They're like, oh, no, I don't want that complexity. Give me simple. Give me simple. The patient is complex. Right, the care environment's complex. They don't want the technology to be complex. But let's get to this example. So um, for a variety of you know, reasons, but to uh, protect proprietary information, we can't reveal what this is. But, so this is a conceptual uh, wireframe rendition of the product that we worked on. This is the original interface. So you see that there is uh, ooh, there we go, an on and off button. There's some displays, but there's no, no clear starting point, no clear sequencing uh, of tasks. There's, just, there's a lot of options available. All the options that were possible in this product are available to the user as soon as they approach the interface. This is the revision of the interface, and all credit go, goes to Shannon here. Anything you see that's pretty in this uh, presentation, Shannon gets the credit. Um, the same tasks are available, and people who know exactly what they want to do, whoop, there we go, can choose the tab at the top if they want to go directly to that feature, if they're an experienced user or they have a narrow scope. If they're starting at the beginning, right, and they need some help, they can choose if they get step-by-step -step instructions if they're a novice user, right, or if it's a task they don't do very often. I know when I was an ER nurse, I was terrified that we'd have to use the uh, auto um, transfuser thing where the, it sucks up the patient's own blood and then gives it back to them because we use it like once a year, right? And, and nobody knew how to set it up. It was, gonna, it was just going to be a train wreck. Um, and then we see that we have tasks, right, separate. So you can choose which particular task 
And once you choose that task, it's going to take you to a particular tab, and all you're going to see is the information you need to do that one task, not all the other options. So you're not having to sort that out uh, all the time as you go. Uh, here's an example, the Sharp C project. How many are you familiar with the Sharp C? Let's see a few nods. Okay, so uh, through you know healthit.gov, um, the ONC, et cetera, that several research uh, universities throughout the nation have worked on improving EHR design. And they have, I think it's called Inspired EHRs or something like that. If you go to the website, and I've got a link at the end, if you go to the website, you can, uh, they have some kind of prototypes of how things might work differently. This particular one, right, what we see is that the test result um, here and the action that you're going to need to take to follow up on that test result are on the screen at the same time. You're not having to get the result and then click through and find patient information to call them or enter some other information. It's all available on the screen at the same time. Uh, the active record is highlighted so you know the field in which you're working. You're not having to hunt for the fields. The other records for the other patients, right, they're still listed there. You haven't lost that, but they're grayed out. So you're, it's very clear, because one of the most common errors, right, is documenting on the wrong patient's chart. Sometimes that's not discovered right, until, until much later, right, until another error is made, a lab order is made, or some kind of diagnostic error is made. Um, and I think we've got one more on there. There we go. And the patient name being prominent, right, again, to prevent that very common error. We're all, it's like slow motion. Okay, so now we'll go on. Uh, any questions there or comments or um, those of you who feel like you know about a technology where they're really doing it well, just from what we've covered so far? Yeah, I'll just call on you every once in a while we keep you awake. Um, so now SMART. So this is the extrinsic load, right? How to keep the technology from adding uh, too much to the person's load. So here's an example from uh, automotive. Uh, newer cars, how many of you have a backup camera or some kind of a, a AV? Yeah, a handful of those, right? Uh, I don't have one, but my, my friend, my husband's car and some friend's car, they have the screen over here to the right, and we're backing up. And I'm like, well, that's all very groovy, except you're having to like look down at that. And it's like, what, what about what's happening to the front you know, of your car while you're focused on the screen going backwards? Uh, this, you'll notice, it's putting it up in where the, hopefully the driver should be looking most of the time, right? Some direction information. So you want to be a natural extension of the user and of the task. So let's look at some additional examples. There we go. So back to our safety example with the potassium before, right? There are a number of times when the system could have it could have been smart and provided support. And I know this is a this is a tough balance because we're also trying to stay away from alert fatigue. Right, and we know that the doctors have memorized usually where all the um, alerts come up and they just cancel them out, right? Alert override is one of the, the big problems. But if the uh, messages were helpful, right, and came up at a particular time and told you exactly what the, the problem was, you can recognize the patient already has fluid, so he wouldn't have written that first order, you know, or if he started, if he just chose potassium, there could have been an alert there. There we go. Recognizing the unsafe levels, that there were two orders, right, throughout. So everywhere we have one of these red things, right, you can imagine that the system could have provided some kind of support. Second thing about the extrinsic, to decrease the extrinsic load, and again, that's all the stuff about uh, interruptions, distractions, noise, right, is to be calm. So being thoughtful about your use of color. And you notice, even in this presentation, maybe that's what has everybody so relaxed, right? We, we intentionally chose kind of a very zen, right, uh, color palette. It's, that's important because you want, we'll get to that, but want uh, emergency kinds of things to show up, right? But otherwise, you don't want to be taxing the person. Uh, format, ample white space, right? Fonts that aren't busy, that you don't have to focus on to read where it's obvious and uh, where the size and the, the clarity. Uh, and sound and motion, so being judicious in your use of sound and motion. Another quote, we assume if it looks nice, it's a good product. Um, so, so they do notice that, right? If it, if it looks clunky, if it looks old, uh, if it looks like it's going to be complicated, if it's small font, they're immediately like, oh, mm -mm, no, this, this is going to be hard. This is going to be trouble. So I'll just click through these because I've already given you the heads up, right? So here's an alternative palette that we could have used. And I like this palette. I think it's very pretty, right? If I were doing another website, I might use this palette. But we look. 
And see the little red thing? Oops, there we go. Right, so we have a little emergency. When you see the, the emergency here, alert, right, if, you, if that were on some screen, on this palette versus, well, the brighter palette, <laughs> right? It's just, so if the palette itself is noisy, then when you, you actually want them to pay attention to something, it's not going to pop out as easily. Um, here we have the same thing. There we go, right? So you don't want a lot of animation. If you do have animation, you want it to be purposeful. I'm sorry, I, this thing and I are just going to fight, apparently. <laughs> there we go, right? So you see the blood pressure clicking there. To, to get the attention, but it doesn't necessarily have to go beep, 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 right? Just being really thoughtful about that. There, there's no one single way to do it. The goal here is just to be thoughtful about that, to appreciate that animation, sound, those, those are taxes on people. So if you have them, make sure it's purposeful. And then finally, and some of the things that might uh, surprise you more, are the consistency and team player um, modules. Consistency we know, and those of you who've worked on tech design or written software, you know that those are some basic principles, that you have style sheets and that kind of thing to make sure that, that you have some consistency in your product. Often it's presented as part of the branding, right, just that it's good for our brand. Um, you may or may not be thinking about usability, but it's important that for the user, you know, we talked about how um, fast they're moving and how quickly they develop muscle memory about where, the, where to click. That's why the consistency is important. Every time they have to hunt for a button or hunt for a function, hunt for a feature, you know, you've lost them, right? You've had a cost on their cognitive load, which could impact safety and quality later. So some of the things for consistency, I've already alluded to most of them, right? Appearance, um, layout, and that's, that has to do with the white space and the location of things, and we'll get to an example. And then the operation, and, right? And that's like the toggle switch thing that we talked about, turning on and off, right? If you have um, go, send, submit, Right, those are three different ways that are kind of getting a function to go, but if every screen it's a different word, again, seems minimal, but that's the kind of thing you're just eroding, right? Uh, it's sort of drip, drip, drip away uh, at the person's cognitive capacity. So here's an example, right? Um, also taken from the uh, ONC website of examples of problems. Minimal, minimal, minimal. It seems small, but you have a submit button over here to the right, and then you have one down to the left, and another screen, it was at the bottom right, right? Every time people are zooming across the screen with their mouse, hunting around, looking for the submit button, right? You've taken away cognitive load that could better be used on patient care. So you want to be consistent within the product. There we go, we'll get that. And I've used the submit button, right? But it includes everything. Um, alerts, uh, the mode, how they know what uh, state the system is in, any kind of buttons. And also the degree to which you have any kind of control over this, you'd like to be consistent with users' expectations. So if you're choosing between two products, and I just want to show you uh, a card sort that, you know, now you can do these electronic, but this is just a, uh, a photo from a project where we had, where we actually had, you know, all the information was going to be on the screen. We have it on note cards, and the users sort what makes sense to them. You know, if you're at the vendor and you're on the design side of things and you have that luxury to design the product to fit, uh, those of you who are on the purchasing side, you might not have uh, this capability, and you might not need to go through the card sort, but again, having some basic idea of how yours, uh, the users for that particular device, how they think, what's important to them, what they use as category labels, um, will help you make better choices. And then it also helps to get into the environment, right, as we saw with Rook, but here's some others from the uh, OR study that I mentioned. Just really seeing what's the context within which this is going to be used, right? Is the person also pushing a cart right, into the autoclave at the same time they're supposed to be entering information about that load that they're autoclaving, right? Are they going to be standing at a desk? Are they walking in a hall? You know, what else is going on at the same time? We often um, assume if it's health IT and it's on the computer that they'll have a nice well-lit place to sit and work, but I think all of you know, right, from being out there that it, it can vary widely, right? They can be leaning over a shelf, uh, they can be looking to the right at the monitor while they're typing on a keyboard that's on a shelf to the left, right? We see all sorts of craziness. And finally, uh, being a team player. So it's important to recognize that every application or technology that a person is using is part of a technology team or a larger ecosystem might be the term you're familiar with, even if it's not designed to be that. 
So we'll look at the vendor's worldview. They come to chat with you about their product, right? Here's our, I, I've got like two minutes. Here's our uh, new awesome product. And by the way, we've got some other awesome products we'd also like to sell you if you decide you like this one. Oops, sorry. Oh, competing products. Of course, we're aware of those, right? And here's why we're better than all the competing products. There we go. And maybe some related products, right? So that's kind of their view of the world, but mostly awesome product. That's why they're there to talk to you. Sorry, I keep looking at the screen because I can't tell when it switches. There we go. Here's the nurse's worldview, right? So um, over here is the awesome product. There's all sorts of competing products. They're all the same size. There's a whole bunch of stuff, right, that the nurse is looking at at any particular time. Not to mention, uh, oh, yeah, there's an in-service on safety, and they're supposed to be getting on the computer to do personal education about HIPAA when they have time. It's time for the OSHA uh, revision and back safety and yada, 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 right? They're continuing education hours. It goes on and on. And so the poor little Acme product, right, is stuck over there in the corner. You saw it. So again, here are the six principles. The next time a new technology comes to you, right, ask yourself these questions, right? Is it simple? Is it helpful? Is it smart? Is it calm? Does it offer a consistent experience? And is it a team player? You know, are, is my staff going to have to relearn how things work to do this? And just a couple of uh, cartoons. You have to have the cartoons. Um, this is a quickie, we can skip this, just to know if you decide to do a more formal review, and this is not marketing for myself, I want you to know this is out there and there are lots of people in town that do this work, heuristic review or formal usability testing, even if you can't change the way Epic or Cerner does something, doing that testing can be a heads up to you about where the trouble points might be so you can improve the training, because the training is usually horrible, by the way. Um, so good usability can turn your users into superheroes, or not. And in case you can't read this, officer, I was doing fine, drinking coffee, shaving and changing radio stations at the same time, then my cell phone rang. And we see what happened. So that's all, and I know I've kind of run up to the nick of time. We just have about five minutes for questions, but, and by announcements, I'm not sure what else needs to happen, but thank you. Thanks. If you want to know more, a number of, uh, of resources and uh, healthit.gov as well. Yeah. Yeah. Look at this presentation. I wonder if you could comment on how the way you will fit into most presentations on products, only teach 20% of the product, get the job done, and there's still 80% left in the products that people are using. I think it needs to affect training, right? So I think we can affect training before we can affect usability. Um, I'm hoping that all of you will start to become a force for usability so you start raising issues about it. But how it affects, um, also training needs to not be a one-time event. So there's the training for Go Live, all right? And so often, you guys know this, you know Go Live is just the beginning of a new chapter, right? But so many, often it's so hard to get to Go Live that it's often treated as like the end game, like, whew, okay, we made it, we made it through Go Live in that first week and all's better, right? Oh, no, 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 right? Go Live is just the beginning of adoption. And so I would have planned like quarterly trainings to advance beyond that. They may have to use the function before then. You. Um, but that, that would be my suggestion. We try to do too much at once. That was the feedback we got from you know, our trainees in a couple different locations. It's just like, it's just too much. So either start providing training earlier with opportunities to practice, right? Because if you do the training and then they don't practice, that's lost. So training and practice, um, but then refresh your trainings afterwards where then you add, okay, great, now you know how to do this. Now let's add. Does that help at all? I don't, you know. It doesn't change the usability of the device, but. I, it's just important that it be, uh, so what a nurse considers simple and straightforward may be different than what an analytics person considers to be simple and straightforward based on the other interfaces that they're used to working with, but the principles still apply. 
and I've worked with a couple of different analytics firms who had you know great products in terms of the power, the analytic power, but people weren't using their product because they opened it and went, uh, -uh. you know, a scramble. I've got an, my, I have enough other work to do. So um, I think the principles definitely apply. Just how they're operationalized, you know, would be uh, the analytics people might not want all icons. They might be insulted by that. So that's why it's important to understand your user base. That's the ideal. I, I think that in our current context, we know that we're sort of stuck with training. But how many of you read all the instructions for your consumer devices? Pull that sucker out of the box and go, right? Um, and then when you run into trouble, then you go to the to the instructions like, oh, there must be something in here, maybe, right, that tells me how to do this. So uh, intuitive, and that's what they were trying to get at with the efficiency, effectiveness. If it's intuitive, then they're faster at doing it. They make fewer mistakes, and they feel better when they got done, right? That they feel like they had a clear beginning end and that they accomplished their task. If it's intuitive, you get the result. Learnable, other people will say, well, it's a very learnable technology. And there may be some that I think most EHRs where it's sufficiently uh, complex that, yes, there may be some learning, you know, but it should be consistent enough so that if I use it today, it's easy to retain that and apply it to every other screen I'm going to see. Right, so if I learn this one task or how this operates, it should help me with the rest of the product. But the, the goal is is intuitive. Um, Apple, the Fitbit, and Garmin. Shannon and I just finished a study on one of these that we funded ourselves because often we can't use pictures right of the products that we're working on. And um, Garmin had more features. They cost about the same. Users preferred the Fitbit hands up. We were having them look at the data interface so they, after you use it, and then you're looking at your numbers. Hands down, it was all out the interface because it was intuitive and they'd say, oh, I just, I know I can see this is different than that. Yeah, I know. One, one more question. Yeah, I'll make it quick. So um, when you talked about how different doctors and nurses just got fed up with trying new, new software, new applications, whatever it may be, they went up and fixed it, they had new equipment, that was bad mentally. Do you find it bad because they just continue to gain that confidence with the new legacy applications that sort of allow them to grow and maybe be more uh, innovative in what they're Oh, I don't know that I said that it's, uh, I don't remember saying that it's bad, so it's interesting. <laughs> it's interesting feedback, but that's all right. Oh. I could probably point out the slide you have to work. Okay, yeah, yeah, well, let, let, let's come back. To, excuse me, I just destroyed the pointer. Um, <laughs> well, we, we can come back to that, but... but Go and see these presentations okay, online. lovely. I'm going to I'm going to recommend the Microsoft Technology Center. Okay. Thank you. Any more final comments? I'm around. I just want to say just one more time that I have the hour at the Barton Springs? 6th Street. Ah, downtown. Okay, got it. Very valid parking. And Perfect. Okay. That information's on the sheet, so don't forget to do your your evaluation and you can tear off the topic you want to keep that information. And also, don't forget to look at the WANA board up here. It's a new networking event we're trying to do to help oh, good. people interacting. That's so I, I just wanted to clarify what you said. So, after usability, you'll have to go search online to find this presentation. It's on the Austin Hymns chapter website. Okay, so I have to go to the website and then if you're going to be using it, you're fine. We're new, we're new to our chapter, so I just want to be sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. No, thank you. Oh, thank.